Hello, I'm JW. This is the third part in the lighting series, and this time I'm going to have a look at connecting, say, other equipment in, such as fans or, uh, say, outside lights with motion sensors and similar things, and also how you can actually add a light, say, from an existing switch or something, when, of course, the wiring wasn't necessarily originally intended to do that. So let's have a look at some situations which uh, do tend to occur quite often, and uh, one of these is where you want to add an extra light but for various reasons it's actually going to be more convenient to connect to the existing switch rather than, say, the ceiling rose or whatever in the ceiling. And the problem with this is that in most cases the light switch on the wall does not have a neutral inside, meaning it's completely useless for connecting another light. So let's just draw in the uh, things as we've seen before. So here's our switch with two terminals and some kind of a contact moves between them. Ceiling rows here, which might say be up in the hallway ceiling or something, fairly inaccessible. And inside we've got our three terminals there. And we've got our earth, of course, but we're not going to show the earth here because obviously that just connects between the various places. So power coming in from the consumer unit, so line neutral. And then to the switch again, we've just got the line from the consumer unit, just continued through. And again, the other cable. Let's go to the other switch contact. And our actual light would be connected here between the two terminals there. Now the problem here is that if you want to say connect an outside light in your front porch, this switch may well be on the outside wall right next to the front door. So Quite a convenient position to put that, just have to put the wires uh, through the wall outside into your new light. But the problem is you can't connect a new light here because you don't have a neutral here. You've only got a line and a switch line, so there's no return path via the neutral. And of course one thing you could do is to uh, hack out the ceiling in your hallway, identify the neutral here, and then of course take wires through the ceiling and across and then outside, and then have another cable coming back to the switch, which would be another switch right here in the same fashion as this one. But of course that does generally involve quite a lot of mess and disruption, and it also means you've got to sort of put channels across the ceiling because the joists in the ceiling inevitably go the wrong way across the hall, so you've got to drill through them, and it can be quite a bit of a bother. But uh, in some cases it's a much easier way of doing this, and what it involves is taking this cable here, which is your twin in earth normally, and replacing it with a three core in earth. Now if someone was kind enough to install the cable in the wall in some kind of conduit or trunking or whatever, then it may well be possible just to pull this out and pull in a new piece at the same time. And if you were to do that, what you'd end up with is a three-core cable. Two cores here connect to the same terminals as before, but what you can then do is to connect the third core to the neutral and then bring that down into the switch as a separate core. Now the colours of these are going to be the new evil colours, which are brown, black and grey. Now in theory you could use either one of these for whichever colour you wanted, but uh, the normal recommended method is to use the brown as the line, black as switched line, which would be the two here, let's go to the switch there. And of course the black would have a piece of the brown sleeving on it, so you basically have a bit of the brown sleeving on there. And then the grey one can actually be used for the neutral. And again, because it's neutral and it's actually grey wire, you would just stick a bit of the uh, blue sleeving or tape over the end to identify that as the neutral. And now your new outside light, which say could just be literally a couple of feet through the uh, door frame outside, can be connected in here. So you need a separate switch, so you're probably replacing the single switch there for a twin switch or a two gang switch. So it's just another switch, electrically not connected to this one, but it's part of the same mounting plate. And your outside light over here will have just your normal line, neutral, and of course earth connections inside. Now between here and there you just need a normal twin and earth cable, which will have your brown, blue, and bare earth conductors inside. So in the back of the switch here you're going to put a neutral terminal. Maybe we'll put the screws or something in. And from there you're going to take your neutral wire, and that's actually going to go out over to your new light outside the door. Now the line has to come from the uh, switch here, and in order to get power to this switch we can just simply use a piece of wire from this one 
over to this one. So this is the line here which comes in from the consumer unit. So this one here is permanently powered. And then that's the one that goes back to that one. So we can continue this permanent power here across to the switch next to it. And now when this switch is actually turned on, the power of course will flow through here and come out of this one. And this one is the one that goes around to your new light outside. So this here now is a three core unearthed cable. And so hopefully you can just pull that in in the space that the old one was in, assuming that's possible. And then here we've just got our two core on earth going out to our new light outside. And of course, as before, you would have the earth connection brought through to all of the various items. Now another place this can be useful is in a kitchen where you might have your lights in the ceiling, switch on the wall, and then you want to put some of those lights underneath the wall cabinets. And again, it will be convenient just to take the wiring from the switch. So you can do a similar thing here, either by, say, pulling in a new cable in the position of the old, or even just, uh, say, fitting a three core earth cable to the switch in the first place if the kitchen was being refitted. And then you've got your line, switch line for the scene light, and the neutral. Then you just loop across to the second switch and then take the cables directly out of the switch box to whatever lights you have underneath the cabinets. And again, normally that's going to be only like a foot or so away, so a lot easier and more convenient than having wires all going back up to the ceiling and then coming back down to the switch and uh, basically duplicating everything. Now obviously that's not usable in all situations, but uh, certainly something to consider for things like, say, kitchen cabinet lights or, say, adding an outside light or something when you've got the switch nearer than the actual light position. Now another common situation is extractor fans as installed in bathrooms and toilets. And these are often installed so that they actually switch on with the light and then they'll continue to run on for a certain amount of time, usually like 10 minutes or something, after the light is switched off. Now of course you can just have a fan on its own switch, so you just turn it on and off, but the reality is that people tend not to use them in that case, they just can't be bothered. And even if they just switched it on, of course, then there's every chance they're just going to leave it turned on and it's going to be running on for hours and hours or even forever. So uh, switching on with the light is uh, a fairly common situation because in most cases you're going to have to go in the room and turn the light on, particularly if there's no window. And it's fairly likely that people are going to turn the light off when they leave. And if they don't, then it's also going to be fairly noticeable that the light, of course, uh, is still shining away in there. Now, as before, you're going to have some sort of light in the ceiling. And we'll do all those sort of ceiling rows again here, but this could easily just as be a uh, junction box or similar. Again, it doesn't uh, really matter. And you would have the earth terminal here, but again, we're not going to draw that in because uh, obviously it just connects to the earth terminals and all of the devices. So as before then, the uh, power coming in from the consumer unit, so line and the neutral there. And the uh, light in the room, of course, would connect to those two terminals, so that would just be coming down like this. And then your switch on the wall or possibly one of those dreadful manky pull cords on the ceiling, would have the two terminals. So we'll draw this as just a normal switch on the wall here because uh, not really much point in uh, drawing a ceiling one because basically they've got the same terminals inside. And uh, as we saw previously then, it's just connecting these two wires to the switch like that. So uh, power coming in goes to the switch if the switch is on, it then returns here, powers the light, and then the neutral return is there. And then this is where your light would be located. Hopefully a bit more sensibly shaped than that. Now, if you wanted an extractor fan which just turned on when the light was on, and then turned off when the light was turned off, then all you've got to do is to connect it in the same position as the light itself. So neutral here and line over here and then simply the light would come on and with the fan, and when the light was off, the fan will be off as well. However, the problem with that is that as soon as people have left the room, the fan has gone off, so it might only be on for a short time. So you can buy fans which have a timer built in, and inside the fan there will be a set of terminals. You will have line, neutral, and switched line, usually marked as SL. And there's quite often an earth terminal, but again, you would take the earth to the uh, earth terminal in the usual way. Now, because a fan is a separate device, and bearing in mind that it can actually continue running when the light is actually turned off, it is useful to have an extra switch so that you can actually turn the fan off completely for cleaning it or whatever. Because otherwise, if you just turn the light off, well, the fan can continue running. 
might have to sort of hang around for 20 minutes while the timer sort of times out. And even then, there's still going to be power connected here, so obviously not ideal if you wanted to clean the thing. So uh, what you actually have in here is a three-core cable, normally a three-core and a half cable. And then in here you have a three-pole switch. And these are sold specifically for fans. Six terminals. And it's essentially three of these crammed into the same casing with a massive big fat switch on the front. And all it's doing is just simply connecting or not connecting the pairs of terminals. So this is in the off position. When you press it to the on position, then all three of those are just connected there, there, and there. No connection between the individual pairs. And in terms of connecting that, well, again, pretty straightforward. Line, switch line, and neutral. And these things are normally marked as such on the back as well. And then it's a question of where you connect these three here. Well, we already know that line is going to be the permanent power, so we can take that straight over to the line in the middle. That's the one that's normally called loop, which may be uh, somewhat confusing for some people. Neutral, well again, fairly obviously that neutral is going to go over to the uh, neutral terminal over there. And this is how the fan manages to stay running, even when the light is off, because bear in mind this is your permanent power for the consumer unit. So the power goes straight through to the fan, assuming the isolator is closed, and provides power permanently on the line and neutral. So the fan can run any time it likes, providing the timer is obviously set to do that. And to activate the timer, then it's the switched line connection, and that goes to the same one that comes back from the switch, so it's our third terminal here. So what happens is the light is turned off initially, so although the fan has power on these, there's no signal here, so this is basically not connected. And then the fan just sits there waiting for something to happen. When you turn the light on, as in connecting these together, then this terminal is connected to line. The light comes on, and this is also connected to line now, so the timer inside the fan will start the fan running. And whilst the light is on, the fan will continue running all the time. But then when you turn the light off, so this is no longer connected, this isn't connected anymore, and the fan will continue running on for the timer, say 10 minutes or whatever, because it has its permanent power provided from the line here and of course the neutral. And then after your 15 or 20 minutes or whatever, the fan will switch off. So that's a bathroom fan, and uh, say this is a fairly common arrangement, particularly in say small bathrooms or toilets and whatever, particularly where they have no window or no opening window. Now some manufacturers of fans uh, ridiculously state they should have a 3 amp fuse, in the connections to this fan. Now, quite frankly, that's a little rubbish because the uh, cabling is what's being protected by the fuses, not the actual device itself. And there may be some claims that uh, if you don't fit this 3-amp fuse, then when the fan sets on fire or blows up, then you can't claim on the warranty. But the reality is you're not going to be claiming on that anyhow because three years down the line it's broke. Well, you're just going to go and buy another one. If you wanted to fit a fuse here, though, then the only place you can actually do it is here on the power that comes in to the bathroom. You can't put it here because of course you've still got the other line coming through on the switch line and you certainly can't put a fuse in both because if one fuse failed and the other didn't then who knows what the fan would do. It may just run continuously or who knows what. So annoyingly it has to go here basically on the power coming in before it gets to this thing which unfortunately means you're going to have to have the light on that as well. So you take out the fuse and the light's not working. And then there are other ways of doing this, so you can have various complex arrangements here, having this before, and then another junction box with effectively that inside, just for the fan and all that bother, but quite frankly, uh, a load of bother for very little gain. Now, a couple of other things to uh, consider, which are relatively common, one of which is a motion sensor, often called uh, PIRs for passive infrared, although you can get ones that work on uh, microwaves as well. And uh, these are the things which you uh, stick outside your house so that uh, if something moves outside then it will turn one or more lights on, typically used on driveways at the front of your house and similar. Now you can buy lights with these things stuck on the bottom but generally they're a bit of a disaster because it generally works out that uh, to get the actual sensor in the correct position the light is blazing horizontally into your neighbour's windows. And if you put the light at a sensible angle lighting up the floor, then unfortunately the sensor's pointing at the ground and doesn't actually cover the area you want. 
So you can buy these things as a separate item, and these are very simple to wire in. The sensor itself will have inside three terminals. There will also be a connection for Earth as well, but uh, again, we're not showing that in this diagram because it's just a question of connecting the Earth wires to that. And inside, you're going to have a line, a neutral and switched line. Now, power needs to come into this thing permanently because, of course, it needs to be powered so it actually works. If the power was not connected, then obviously it's not going to connect or detect anything. It won't actually work at all. So power from the consumer or whatever comes in to the line here and obviously to the neutral as well. So this just basically powers the sensor and therefore you can either detect whether it's daylight or not and whether there's people moving and uh, switch on as required. Now internally all the sensor is doing is basically acting as a switch. So if uh, movement is detected it connects line to switch line internally. So those two are connected internally and then after a predefined delay of say five minutes or whatever then it uh, disconnects these and therefore obviously the light is turned off. So in terms of fitting in your LED floodlight here which has one of those little chip things in the middle there and this is all that sort of uh, material like that. All you've got to do is to put your sensor on the wall, bring the cabling in with the permanent power and then from there you're going to have your cable from the LED, one of which goes to the switch line terminal and the other one to the neutral. So neutral is connected straight through on the same terminal, power coming in, powers the sensor permanently and then when the thing detects some kind of motion and it's presumably dark as well, connects those two together and the light turns on and these normally have a timer that's adjustable so you can set it to switch off after five minutes so it doesn't waste huge amounts of electricity. So pretty straightforward devices and so the microwave ones again it's the same kind of terminal arrangement it's just that they use uh, actual microwaves rather than uh, infrared beams coming from the heated object so uh, microwaves generally are more sensitive because it's actually sending out a signal which then reflects back on something whereas these uh, just basically rely on some hot object as a person or next door's dog or whatever walking in front of the sensor. Now another satanic device is a dimmer and uh, dimmer switches are a direct replacement for your normal switch on the wall. So switch on the wall like this, two terminals with a moving contact and then you'd have your line and switch line going in. Now if you want to change that to a dimmer, well very straightforward, you simply remove this and then here's your uh, dimming switch. Dimmers usually have the terminals in a different position, quite often in a row at the top. But the actual connection is exactly the same. If it's a one-way dimmer, as in it's just got two terminals, then only two of these will have metal inside. You'll usually find that the third hole is there, but it's just a hole, there's no actual metal inside it. So it's just a question of connecting in the line and the switch line. And then the only difference being is to generally have a rotary knob on the front. So you can obviously turn that to A, switch the light on and off, and of course vary the brightness that uh, actually the light is set at. Some of these have a press knob, and those are the ones which would have three terminals, all of which would be used. Those are the ones you can use with a two-way uh, switch arrangement. So you would have your wires coming in, and then you'd have your three core cable going off to your other switch at the end of the hall or whatever. And the thing to notice here that on traditional dimmers like this you can only have one on the actual circuit so if you wanted a dimmer and uh, say another switch further down the hallway one can be a dimmer and the other one is just a normal two-way switch as we saw in a previous video. You can't have two dimmers connected like this because if you do they're going to sort of basically compete with each other and the lights are going to be going all over the place and up and down and it's simply not going to work properly. Disadvantage to this arrangement if someone turns this knob down to minimum, when you go to the other switch, it will still turn the light on and off, but it will turn it on and off at the absolute minimum level, so you can't actually control the brightness from both locations. You can buy what's called master and slave dimmers, which are wired in a totally different way, and those are generally touch-sensitive jobs and uh, fairly unreliable, but nevertheless on those you can actually uh, press your finger on one at one end and then turn the brightness up and down and do likewise at the other end of the hallway. 
However, you shouldn't really be fitting dimmers and stairways and the like because, of course, it's going to be quite dim and you don't want to have dimly lit stairs. And how annoying if someone had turned it down to minimum at the bottom and then you found you couldn't turn it on because, of course, it was uh, too dim to actually see anything. Nevertheless, dimmer switches, same connections. Just be aware that the connections on the back may be in a different order, so best pay attention to uh, what's marked for what. And it doesn't matter which way around these are connected. Again, this could be line here, this could be switch line. That might be line and switch line there. But I say it doesn't really matter. That could equally be switch line and line because, bearing in mind, both line, it's an AC circuit. Absolutely no difference which way around these things are connected. Dimmers, thankfully, are becoming somewhat out of fashion because uh, most lights now are LEDs. Traditional dimmers like this generally don't work particularly well with LEDs. There are some combinations which can work, but of course equally there's many others which do not. So uh, dimmers are generally something to be avoided. And dimmers are also fairly unreliable. If you put a normal filament lamp on the end, when the lamp blows it quite often destroys the electronics in the dimmer at the same time. So dimmers if you must fit them, but uh, generally it's best to avoid those. A much better solution is to have, say, three circuits in the room and, say, six lights in the ceiling. And then you can switch on one or more of the lights in various combinations by using the various switches you've got. Far more reliable and certainly a lot less trouble. Now, a final note here is ceiling fans. And these are these devices where you have your uh, ceiling in the room here, and there's a rod sort of coming down, and on the end of it, you've generally got this uh, fan arrangement here. And then underneath, in some other horrible designs, you've got this dreadful cluster of sort of lights poking out at various different angles. So the uh, fan can rotate, and the lights can, of course, uh, light up. Now, well, there's several ways to wire these things, and the easiest and quickest way is in the actual terminal block inside the fan here, it will just have line, neutral, and earth. And all you bring in here is basically the switched line. So we'll put uh, switch line there. Neutral, of course, in the uh, blue. And obviously earth would be the uh, green one. And if you're converting this from an existing seating rows, then the permanent line is not connected to the fan at all. Otherwise, of course, it would be running continuously. How annoying would that be? So you'd simply provide a fourth terminal, probably yourself, because fan manufacturers really provide such things. And that would be your loop, if you want to call it that. And basically where the permanent power would go in. Now this is fine. What this results in is that the switch on the wall over here, when it's on, power is provided to the fan. When it's off, the fan doesn't work at all. And these fans usually have a sort of a chain that hangs down to turn on the fan. And it's usually very speed, it's sort of pull for fast, pull for slow, and pull for off. And then there's another one that hangs down from here somewhere, which is for the light. So turn it on the wall, and in fact you can leave it on there all the time if you want. Fan on and off, light on and off. So that's the sort of basic way of doing it. If you want to go to the bother of actually replacing the cabling from here, back to the thing in the ceiling, then you can arrange it uh, somewhat differently. And in this case, what you do is to have two switches here. Both of the uh, on-off variety. And then rather than using the uh, pulley cord things on the fan itself, which some people may find unsightly, then what you can do is run a three core earth cable to this device here. So you're going to have your permanent power going into the top of the switch, and just as with the outside light deal, you can link that across to the other one. Neutral and earth, of course, remain the same, and you bring the earth down to the switch as well. And then what you can do here is your three core earth cable, you can take a wire from here back to the fan, and that would, say, do the light on the fan. And then from this switch here, back to your fan, that would actually do the fan part. So you could then control the two things individually from the wall with two separate switches. All you have to do in the top of the fan is to identify which wire goes to the light and which one goes to the fan. Normally it's either red and brown or some other similar combination, and then just connect these as appropriate to uh, the various terminals. However, this is only really possible if you can actually replace the cable to the wall switch which, of course, in many cases, is not going to be easy to do without uh, pulling out the wall and uh, fetching down the ceiling. 
So let's look there at uh, connecting various other devices, such as extractor fans and outside lights and things. And of course, there's several ways you can connect these devices. It's really just a question of which is most convenient at the time. And of course, that will vary depending on the exact layout of the building or whatever you're working in. But uh, the basic principles are the same. So it's just a matter of identifying the wires and installing them in the correct fashion. And certainly with lighting, it's absolutely essential to identify what's there before removing anything, because as of course before, there's many different ways of wiring things. And of course, if something's been working correctly for years, there's no reason to go changing it and altering all the wiring layout or assuming that just because they did it in a different way, it's somehow wrong or has to be altered. So before taking any kind of lighting system apart, make a note of exactly what is connected where and generally it'll be much easier then when you come to put it back together. So that's pretty much it for the lighting series there. And until next time, thanks for watching.